We're going to go ahead and get into this word and go ahead and get started. And uh, we'll be looking at Psalm 9 tonight. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 12, Psalm 9, verses 1 to 12. But before we begin, let's open up in prayer. O Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him? Son of man, Lord, that you even take notice of him. So Lord, we thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that you make ways continually out of no way for us and you provide for us in ways that we see and ways that we don't see. So we praise you for that tonight, Lord. We ask, Lord, that as we study your word tonight, that you would let the words of our mouths, even the very meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Yes. We praise you, Lord, for saving us from our sins. We ask you to forgive us, Lord, of our sins that we have committed in word, thought, and deed. Lord, as we open up your word tonight and sit under your word, we pray that you would Give us insight for living. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Psalm 9, Psalm 9, in verses 1 to 12, the Word of God says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations. You have Destroy the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins. And you have uprooted the cities. The memory of them has perished. But the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. And he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Yes. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds. For he who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Amen. Amen. So tonight, we're looking and considering tonight the, the topic of praising God for his justice for his, and righteousness. Praising God for his justice and righteousness. Right. In preparation for this particular study tonight, I came across a couple of books. Uh, the first book is a, is a book by a gentleman by the name of T. David Gordy. And the title of this book is Why Johnny can't sing hymns. Why Johnny can't sing hymns. And he wrote a companion book to this book, Why Johnny Can't Sing Hymns, entitled Why Johnny Can't Preach. Why Johnny Can't Preach. But the first book, Why Johnny Can't Sing Hymns, T. David Gordon, he writes that uh, 
The reason Johnny can't sing hymns is due to the most part to the contemporary style of music that is occurring in most churches today. And with that, he says, and I'm just summarizing what he's saying in his book, he says the the, inferior, the inferiority of uh, the words, the lyrics, the theology that's contained in most contemporary songs being sung in contemporary church today is the reason why Johnny can't sing hymns. And I'm glad here at the Mount Zion Church that we are a church that we have not forsaken singing hymns. And so in his book, his other book, which is a companion, he, he says the reason Johnny can't preach is because media has basically become more important to Johnny preaching than the people in the pews and giving the people in the pews what thus says the Lord. And so in summarizing both those books, if the primary means of God speaking to his people is through the preached word. And if that primary means has declined, then the primary means of us speaking to God in worship is praise, because that's what praise is. Then the reason why Johnny can't sing hymns and we can't sing hymns is because our language, our praise of God has declined. And so when we look at Psalm 9 tonight, what we understand from Psalm 9 is that uh, this is a psalm of praise. Actually, the entire Psalter is a song book. There are also prayers in the Psalms as well. But it's a song book. Many of the Psalms are basically to be sung according or with the accompaniment of music if you will, or musical instrumentation, if need be. And so psalms, for the most part, are hymns of praise to our God using words of Scripture. And so when we come to this psalm right here, we see that this psalm is... Uh, Dedicated, or it has a subscription, a subtitle there that says for the choir direction or the choir director. And it says on Muth Laban, a psalm of David. And so this was a psalm written by David where he is instructing the choir director on how to sing this particular song. And then you have the words of Muth Laban. And so those particular words, uh, I mean, they, they really, I mean, we could go deep into why people are speculating regarding who that is, but it basically is death of a son is what it means. But we don't know what son that is. So this song is about Praise. The first half of this particular psalm, verses 1 to 12, is about praise. 
That's what we'll be looking at tonight. But the second half of this psalm, uh, the second half, verses 13 to 20, it's devoted to prayer, which lets us know that praise and prayer are interconnected. As I've said in the past, praise leads to prayer, and prayer ought to lead to praise. So, and so what we need to understand tonight, if we don't grasp anything else, and that is our God is always due praise. Mm -hmm. Our God is always due the highest praise. And the reason he is due the highest praise is for who he is and for what our God has done. Yes, our God is due praise in good times. Our God is due praise in bad times. Praise is to be rendered unto our God when we're happy. And praise is to be rendered unto our God when we're sad and praise is to be rendered unto our God when we are mad. In other words, we should praise our God when we up yes. and we should praise our God when we are down. You know, it's easy to praise God when everything's going up. When you feel like you're up and everything's going right, you feel like you come in here, you're on cloud nine, you can give God praise. The difficult thing to do is to praise God when things are not going well for us. Or we are on a downturn, a down slope in our lives. And so, Beloved, in a world such as ours that is marred by all kinds of sin and filled with all kinds of violence, you know, it's very easy for us to get down. It's very easy for us to become discouraged, even for people who are followers of Christ and those who are just people in general who don't know the Lord. It's very easy when we see what is happening in our world for us to become discouraged. Especially as it pertains to the topic of justice. When we see injustice it's very easy for us to get down and discouraged. But this is what I want you to focus on tonight. I want you to remember this. No matter how much injustice we see in this world, no matter how much injustice that is occurring in our world, we must never forget that our God sits enthroned as a righteous judge who is going to judge righteously and judge even the unjust righteously. This is the reason why, beloved, we should never take revenge when we experience injustice in this world. Never take revenge. Because the Lord himself says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Look with me at Romans chapter 12. Romans 
Romans chapter 12. Let's look at verses 17 to 21. This is what the Word of God says. Never repay or never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But watch this. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will reap burning coals on his head. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Did y'all see that? Don't take revenge. When we take revenge, when we, when we act like uh, Dirty Harry, <laughs> when we act, start acting like Dirty Harry or uh, some of them old, uh, what was it, Charles Bronson movies, you know, when we start taking revenge, getting even, what we do is we short circuit the work of God. See, God is working on our behalf to bring us justice. And what, what happens with us is we get frustrated because God ain't moving fast enough. Amen. You know, we want revenge, you know, like now. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you be want something bad to happen like now, so. <laughs> So, you know, we, we take revenge. We got this temptation, rather, to want to take revenge and take the matters into our own hands. Well, but we short-circuit the work of God when we do that. So, instead of taking revenge, our focus needs to be on doing good. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul was talking about in Romans 12 when he says, if, you, if your enemy is hungry, give him some meat. That's unnatural, right? It is. Think about some of your enemies. <laughs> How many of you all going to want to give your enemy something to eat? Yeah, <laughs> 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 or give your enemy something to drink? <laughs> and so we take justice into our own hands. Yeah. So we want to give them some poison. You know, okay, I got something for you. <laughs> so we need to focus on doing good let God take care of the justice of getting our enemies back that don't mean that it, you know sometimes you may have to take a, uh, a civil matter before a civil magistrate I, I hope in the church that we can resolve those issues without having to do that but sometimes there are some matters that have to go before a civil magistrate. But in the body of Christ, we ought to be able to judge those matters amongst ourselves instead of taking them before an ungodly judge. <laughs> right. Hmm. But again, we short circuit the work of God when we take revenge and so do good and continue to focus on Jesus. And so we focus on Jesus by remembering what Jesus went through. I mean, after all, we are not the first people in the world to ever have to go through some injustice. I mean, when you think about what Jesus went through, that was unjust. And so we focus on Jesus this is how the writer of Hebrews says it in Hebrews 12. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12.
Hebrews chapter 12. I promise you we're going to get to this text. Hebrews 12 and 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, Jesus experienced injustice at the hands of people who were closest to him. But he was exalted. And so what we see here tonight is that this psalm is instructive for us on how we ought to praise God for his justice and his righteousness in the face of injustice. How do you do that? How do you praise God for his, uh, his justice and his righteousness in the face of injustice? What does that look like? Or what is the pattern of praise that we need to have in the face of injustice? Because the reality is there is all kinds of injustice going on in our world today, isn't it? I mean, people all in the world, all over the world are living under unjust governments, even in the United States, in various places and cities, there's environmental justice, injustice. You know, in certain areas in the city that I grew up in, down by Rubber Town is what they called it. I mean, they would, they would release them chemicals at night and for the most part, you know, you ride through there, you can still smell it. Yeah. Smells like sulfur down there. And that stuff, they did a study one time down there at Chickasaw Park. They said they had cancer in the fish that was in that lake at Chickasaw Park. And you know if there's cancer in the fish, there's cancer in the water. There's cancer in the water that they drink it. The stuff is in the air. That's environmental injustice. Yeah. Hmm. But not only is there environmental injustice, there's income disparities. Income disparities are injustices. Access to quality health care is an injustice. I ain't just saying you got a doctor that you go to to just write you a, a pill here and there. I'm talking about Good quality health care. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got some doctors who do not give their patients comprehensive medical care. Yeah, that's, true. that's an injustice. When we have uh, all the violence we see in our communities, <clears throat> I mean, the shootings, like the young man that was shot on the school bus stop trying to go to school. That's injustice. Poverty in many respects is an injustice. I mean, there's some various reasons. There's various variables and reasons as to why people, you know, fall into a state of poverty. But sometimes it's financial where they just can't get out. They don't have the financial means to just get out. Child welfare. There's injustices in the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the kids that are predominantly in the child welfare system are African American kids. There's uh, housing inequities. That's injustice. You know, infrastructure inequities. I mean, where I live, They'll pave a road six times before they come to one of the poor communities yeah. and pave a road. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm thinking to myself, there are about 10 roads I can think of in the city that y'all need to be spending some money on. Because you drive through there, you better have your mechanic's phone number on speed dial. Because you're going to come through there, you're going to be thinking, man, I done tore something up in my alignment. And so, even when we look at life in utero, abortion is an injustice. Injustice is violence upon the womb. There is the exploitation of the elderly. That's injustice when elderly people are taken advantage of. Then we see racial and refugee injustice. We'll let these people come in, but we're not going to let these come on, come on. So injustice is all around us. And so how do we praise God in the face of such injustice? Because you all do know that we need to be praising God, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we need to be praising God in the face of injustice. And so this psalmist, I believe, is giving us some instruction here. He's uh, telling us... Uh, who our praise needs to be directed to in the face of injustice. Because the world that we live in is full of praise, right? Yeah. Monday night football come on. There's all kind of praise, right? Mm -hmm. Saturday, when we're watching college football, there's all kinds of praise. We praise our cars. We Praise if you got pets. People praise their pets. <clears throat> they praise their bosses, their co-workers. I mean, the world is filled with praise. The problem is the praise is not directed to God. And so what Psalm 9 does is it kind of realigns us. You know how the car gets out of alignment sometimes. And you got to go get it tightened up and get it realigned. This is what Psalm 9, it, it, it realigns us to show us how our praise needs to be directed to God in the face of injustice. And the reason why we need to have our praise realigned to focus more so on God than the things that are around us is because we praise things because we believe that those things are important. And if we believe something is important, we're going to praise it. If you believe your kids are important, you're going to praise them. If you believe your spouse is important, you're going to praise them. And so if we believe God is important, we ought to praise Him. Because praise is demonstrating the thing in which we are praising, we are in fact enjoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't praise nothing that you don't enjoy. Come on. And so if we enjoy God, we will praise him. So what should be our posture and what should be our pattern of praise in the face of injustice? Does the pattern and the posture of our praise reflect the fact that we are enjoying God? Hmm. You know, I get the opportunity to stand from the pulpit on Sundays and I just observe people's faces, hmm. you know. You can see, <laughs> you know, especially if I'm up here, I can't sing a lick, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, I just, you know, I, I do okay. I get by, you know. I sound real good and shout like everybody else does. <laughs> but uh, you can tell if people are enjoying God and praising God based upon the expressions on their face. Because as we studied last week, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with 
praise. We got to bring some praise with us when we sing. So when we're praising God in the face of injustice, this is a difficult thing to do. Is there gratitude? Is there gladness? Is there glory, a celebration of God's glory, shall I say? Is there a celebration of the greatness of God? Is there a celebration of the goodness of God? Because when we look at these verses before us, we get a posture and a pattern of how we ought to praise our God in the face of injustice. And we do this, first of all, by reflecting on the wonder or the wonderful works of our God with gratitude and gladness. Say verses 1 and 2. What does David say? I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart I will tell of all your wonders I will be glad and exult in you I will sing praise to your name O Most High do you see how many times in the NASB I don't know if you have it in the in another, in your copy of God's word. But you see how many times David says, I will? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four. I will. I will. I will. I will. He is determined mm -hmm. to praise God. He's determined to give God praise in the face of opposition. So he displays this by Gratitude. Gratitude is just simply saying thank you. Thank you, Lord. Being gracious for what God has done for us. I mean, we don't have to be living, do we? I mean, God doesn't have to give us clothes on our back, roof over our head, employment to go to. Some of us, God has blessed us to be able to retire. You know, if you can work on a job 30, almost 40 years, that's a blessing. Folk don't do that every day. Some folk don't even make it to retire. I was talking to somebody about that the other day. I said, you know, there are some folk who don't even get Social Security because they don't even live to see it. And if God has blessed you and let you live long enough... To even get Social Security, that's something to praise God for. That's something to be grateful for. So he says, I'm going to give thanks to the Lord. That's good man. Why do you give thanks? Because God has been good to us. God has done something for us with all my heart. Not half-hearted. His whole heart. The word heart right there is live the entire being, David's entire being. Being, this is coming not from the outside. This is not just mere externals. This is internal praise. His, in, his entire being, his whole heart. But then he says, I will tell of your wonders. Do you see the verbs here? Give thanks. I will tell, give, tell of all your wonders. Now we can't even begin to tell of all God's wonders. Hmm. A synonym for wonders is miracle. I mean, the, the greatest miracle that God is performing today is to save somebody from their sin. And sometimes I believe that we look for God in the spectacular, in the miraculous so much that we miss how God is blessing us in the simplicities of life. Come on. His wonder of sending somebody into our lives to talk to us just when we needed to hear something. His wonder of somebody praying for us just 
when we needed somebody to pray for us. You know, God works miracles without a doubt. But I want to encourage us not to be caught up so much in looking for a miracle over here, a miracle over here, and a miracle over there, but looking for God and his wonders in the simpleness of everyday life. How God wakes us up this morning. Come on. How do you know that when you go to sleep, you're not dead? Yeah. Hmm. There's a lot of people who go go to sleep tonight that they ain't waking up tomorrow. Getting up in the morning is something to tell of God's wonders. Mm -hmm. The simpleness of life, being able to put one foot in front of the other, being clothed in our right frame of mind, so he says, uh, I will give thanks to the Lord. And that Lord, all caps, I deny. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. El Elyon, the Lord, the Most High. And so... This gladness, this rejoicing in God, exulting and gladness are kind of like synonyms. They both convey rejoicing in God, hmm. having joy in God. And so our joy should come from God alone. Not only does worship go to God alone, but our joy our joy ought to come from worshiping God alone, which ultimately leads us to sing praise to his name because his name speaks to his reputation. His name speaks to who he is. As we said, he's the most high God. So let's look at Psalm 91 regarding the Most High. Psalm 91. Psalm 91, uh, verse, verse 1. Psalm 91, verse 1. It should be a very, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Then you go down to verse 9, and the Word of God says, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. So the Lord, he sits high and exalted. He's the most high God. But then when we look at verses 3 to 10, we see David's rejoicing by giving God glory, giving God glory, celebrating God's glory. And the reason he celebrates God's glory is, uh, you can see it, we, we'll walk our way through this, and starting at verse 3, he turned back his enemies, he retreated his enemies, that's verse 3. Because you see that, my, when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. I like the way the, the psalmist says it in um, Psalm 27. Y'all have read that? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In ASB says, when evildoers came up on me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they did what? They stumbled and fell. What does he say? 
In, in Psalm 9, 3, they stumble and perish. And so God retreats our enemies. God fights our battles. The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. But look at verse 4. He says, For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteousness. God judges righteously. God is to be praised for his glory because he, he judges righteously. He judges righteously. We may not always judge righteously. We make unrighteous judgments. But God always judges righteously. But then he says, uh, he, he sits on the throne as a king judging righteously. Verse 5, you have rebuked the nation. So he's a righteous judge. He rebukes the nations. You destroy the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The wicked. God judges the wicked. He blots out their name so that they are not remembered. Six, the enemy has come to end, come to an end in perpetual ruin. He's saying the same thing he said in five. And you have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them has perished. He's praising God. We may think that's crazy, right? He's praising God for defeating his enemies. Have you ever praised God for defeating your enemies? It's okay to praise God to, for defeating your enemies as long as we do it reverently. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, as long as we do it reverently. Because uh, he says... The very memory in verse 6 of them has perished. But verse 7, he says, the Lord abides forever. They perish. But in contrast, the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. His throne is forever. God is eternal. And he will judge the world in righteousness. He's not going to just judge our enemies. God is going to judge the world one day according to his righteous judgment. And he will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. Understand this. God is not going to have unbalanced scales. He's going to judge with equity. There's not going to be somebody who's going to be able to slip the Lord a couple of tens. <laughs> you know, slip the Lord a couple of tens and ask him to look the wrong, you know, look, I, you know, I just need you to look the other way. No, he's going to judge with equity. He's going to judge with a righteous standard. And you know the standard that God's going to use when he judges the world? It's his word. And not just his word, but his incarnate son, his son who came in the flesh. See, a lot of people talk about justice, getting their justice. But let me tell you this. God's justice has to be satisfied as well. God's justice has to be satisfied. I remember I had a conversation with a young man one time and he was telling me that he didn't really believe in all this no more. Grew up in a Christian home, but he don't believe this no more. So he got to tell me about all these different philosophers and all this kind of stuff. I said, well, let me ask you this. How are you going to pay for your sins? How are your sins going to get paid for? I mean, we can talk about what this person said. We can talk about what that person said about what the Bible is. But there's not a religion on the face of the earth that deals with man's sins like Christianity does. So my question tonight is, how are you going to get your sins paid for? How is God's justice going to be satisfied over your life? That's it. Hmm. 
Because the only way God's justice is going to be satisfied over our own lives. Because we don't get in on the buddy plan. Mama may have, Papa may have, but God bless the child, he's got his own. So you got to get your own. And so the only way God's justice is satisfied over our lives is in the Son. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's look at verse 17. See, the word of God says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. New creature. The old things passed away. The whole new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. A reconciliation is in Christ. Two parties estranged. That means that God got beef with you and you got beef with God because you living in sin and you love your sin. <laughs> but God in Christ brings us together. Verse 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here it is. This is how... God's justice is satisfied. Verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to become to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Yes. So God has righteous judgment. God is a refuge. He's a refuge. That's what it says in verse 9. The Lord will also be a stronghold or refuge for the oppressed. God is the God of the oppressed. Those who can, you can see your way up, but you just can't get up. You can see your way out, but you just can't get out. Because there are things pressing you down. Amen. So he's the God. He's a stronghold for the oppressed, even in times of trouble. Let's, let's look here. Psalm 46. Psalm 46. change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam though the mountains quake at its swelling pride say la that means simply pause think about it there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy dwelling places of the most high there it is again God is in the midst of her she will not be moved God will help her when the morning dawn So God is our refuge. He's a stronghold from, for us from the wicked. It's, it's repeated again in verse 10. And those who know your name will, be, will put their trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. He's a refuge to those who know his name. Those who put their trust in him. We have to put our trust in him. Trust in the Lord with all our hearts. Hmm. 
Lean not to all, to our own understanding. In all our ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. Never will I leave thee. Never will I forsake thee. But then, finally, verses 11 and 12. God's goodness is celebrated. We've seen gratitude, glory, greatness, his greatness, his goodness is right here. Greatness was the last verses that we've seen. Glory and greatness were right there, all in there. But in these last two verses, we see his goodness. Because David says, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion, declare among the peoples, his deeds, for he require, for he who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. God hears your tears. God hears your cry. God, beloved, he knows. He knows your name. God will not forget about you. So we recognize his goodness towards us who are the redeemed. This is a call to praise God. This is a call to sing and declare his goodness because we know that God has not forgotten us. God still remembers us. And his goodness is reflected in the fact that he does not forget us. His goodness is also reflected in the fact that God is faithful. But his goodness being reflected in the fact that he does not forget, we need to understand that God is not like us. When the text says that he remembers when the text says God remembers, is what we call an anthropomorphism. It is speaking about God in human form. But God does not have short-term or long-term memory loss. When the text speaks of God remembering something, the text is speaking to God's faithfulness. Because you all remember, don't you? God remembered Noah. Genesis 8. God remembered the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 2. God remembers us. And so we should never forget, even in the face of some of the most Wicked men, women, in, in the face of some of the most unpleasant injustices that God will not forget and that God is faithful. The writer of Lamentations said it this way in Lamentations 3, around verse 23. He simply says, great is is faithfulness. And so, beloved, tonight, if there's anything else that we need to take to heart, and that is we need to remember that our God is faithful and our God will not forget us. And since we know our God is faithful and we know that our God will not forget us, we need to remember the words of the psalmist in Psalm 107. In Psalm 107, the word of God, let's go there. I, I, I like for you all, we can close on Psalm 107. We'll close on Psalm 107. Because mm -hmm. I don't want you all just to hear me say it. I want you all to see it for yourself. The text says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, 
whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. So God is to be praised because he's redeemed us yes. from the hand of our enemies. Amen. So praising God for his, his justice, his righteousness, for his righteous judge his righteous justice even in the face of injustice is not something that is, is easy but it's something that we must do mm -hmm. so God bless you are there any questions tonight mm -hmm. alright well let us pray <clears throat> Lord we are blessed to hear what your word has to say to us tonight regarding your righteousness, your justice, how we are to still praise you, worship you in the face of injustice. And strengthen us, Lord, where we are weak. For where we are weak, Lord, there you become strong. For Lord, your grace is sufficient. And your power is made perfect in our weakness. So give us the strength, Lord, not to take revenge or take matters into our own hands. Watch over us and guard our hearts and our minds. Help us to remember, Lord, that the gentle answer turns away wrath. Yes. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to continually be your witnesses and worship you alone for who you are and what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.